Welcome everyone. Okay, it's my pleasure uh, to have today for this integrative research seminar uh, Emilia Gomez. Emilia Gomez is uh, an associate professor in the uh, Department of Information and Communication Technologies. She's actually a Serra Hunter fellow. Uh, he got, she got uh, uh, an engineering degree in signal processing from the University of Sevilla. Okay, that was uh, some time ago, and uh, then she got a PhD at the uh, at our department, uh, and she has done research stays in all these years in a number of places, including uh, Stockholm, Sweden, McGill University, and the Center for Digital Music at Queen Mary at the University of London. So, without further ado, here uh, Emilia. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction and uh, thank you very much for being here. I'm very happy to talk about my research which deals with music information retrieval. In this uh, talk, I will talk about challenges and opportunities of this field and I will focus on classical music. First, I would like to convince you all of uh, uh, doing research on music or at least um, playing an instrument. Music has been found to be very positive for cognitive stimulation. Not only for learning, but music is also very important uh, or has important links with memory and emotion. For instance, memories which are attached to music can be retrieved faster and have a greater influence to, in our mood. Music in general has a strong influence in all areas of our lives, such as our social relationships or uh, relationship with peers and also our culture. But my research is not only about music, but about music data. One can say that there is one song for every heart, so there is as many songs as people in the world. In fact, only in online music platforms, we can find a huge number uh, amount of songs. For instance, in iTunes or Spotify, we find 40, um, up to 43 million of songs, uh, which are listened by uh, 100 uh, million users. Not uh, for each of these songs, we can also find, for instance, that people do versions or play them in different uh, social networks, in, in, for instance, in YouTube. If we try to find versions of Mahler Symphony No. 4, as you see on the figure, we can find like two, uh, a lot of versions uh, of this song. And not only that, one single version can, uh, can be made of a large amount of data. For instance, we, if we have a recording of the symphony, of the Mahler Symphony No. 4, we can find uh, not only audio recordings, but we can find data related to video recordings. We can also find score information. We can find textual information, which is related to the composer, to the piece, to the performance. So there is a large amount of data that is associated even to a single recording. So this is the kind of thing we deal with, we deal with large scale music collections, not only audio, but anything. So music information retrieval tries to find things in these 43 million of songs. Try to get technologies that can help you to retrieve music. And in the same time, we would like to understand how a person will describe each of those pieces of music and how can we emulate those descriptions by computational model to do a large case analysis. This opens up a very uh, huge amount of applications and also of research areas because you can do research in quantitative data, in large-scale data. So this uh, is the methodology we usually follow in our community. First, we try to talk to humans and model the way they will perceive music or the way they will describe it and depending on the application we will find some descriptors. So we integrate knowledge for human from human perception and cognition. Second thing we do is as we process uh, data, we process for instance music signals, then we have to deal with acoustics and signal processes. So all of some of our research is related to, to this area too. In fact we are dealing with audio or with music, but so we have to incorporate knowledge about music theory, for instance music intervals, how they are built, how people use consonants and dissonance or build scales and so on. 
And finally, as we deal with large amount of information, we have to apply methods and also contribute to improve algorithms for machine learning or for pattern recognition. Our focus, uh, and particularly at the, at the music technology, is to build real applications for real people. So we are also concerned with very practical aspects of research, such as if this can work in real world scenarios, if you can check about scalability, user-centered design, and, and so on. Because we have discovered that maybe some algorithms are very good for a particular application, but totally useless, useless for another application. So the music information retrieval area is not a, a community of people that meet around a conference, which is called the ISMED conference, and there is a society, which now I am president-elect, and it has organized a conference uh, in different places. This year is in New York, and the idea is that there are people from different areas, from musicology, from computer science, from digital libraries, and so on. And it's also uh, very well connected to the industry because many uh, companies are building applications related to our research. So um, the evolution of the field, and first to talk, uh, from talking about a particular application, can be maybe summarized here. People describing music started to describe musical scores because this was the only information we had at the beginning. And then musical scores are usually uh, or uh, found for classical music. Later on, people start this to describe not only scores but audio, and then you can have audio signals from different styles, and you can have large scale analysis. Uh, after, people try to, to describe not only music but uh, content, but also context to information. For instance, people doing a lot of research on web crawling, on incorporating Twitter, or other social uh, or other information which is on the web, images from album covers, for instance, to to describe music. But recently, people are uh, working to with uh, multimodal data with many different sources. They are trying to do also deep learning or this kind of uh, huge machine learning techniques uh, with, uh, in contrast with the future uh, feature engineering that we call that, trying to get good features. And then people are moving from system-centric to user-centered design, so incorporating also personalization, for instance, into the models that we build. In this talk, I, I wanted to, to focus on a particular uh, repertoire because it, I think it's easier to explain uh, the challenges that with the general problem, which is this scenario. Imagine you go to a classical music concert, you will see this uh, orchestra, you, I don't know if you are, uh, if you are, uh, 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 you go very often to this kind of concert. This, this audience is kind of old. You see, there is not many young people, and then uh, you see there is a conductor, and there are like hundreds of musicians playing along with the conductor. So, our project uh, uh, was uh, trying to to ask ourselves which are the main challenges that people. Uh, fine when they go to this kind of concerts, where they go to a piece of music they have never listened to and, and they want to discover. And if our technologies are ready or can help to provide meaningful or to enrich this information and help people better or in a personal way enjoy music concerts. So this is an European project I have been coordinating over the last three years. Here, here I will focus on the work that uh, our group has been doing. And it uh, uh, incorporates uh, uh, partners from music. For instance, we have one of the best orchestra in the world, which is the Royal Conservatory Orchestra in Amsterdam. We have also a conservatory from here that we were very close in this project. We have also some technological partners from Austria, mainly. And we are having so much fun that even if it's uh, finishing or it was finished, we continue. We have some spin-off projects from that. So um, the idea we had is to transform a music concert into what we call a multimodal, multi-layer, and multi-perspective digital artifact. What does mean multi-layer? That you can see the or multimodal. Sorry, that you can see the concert in different modalities. You can check video files. You can look for audio files, for text, 
What does multilayer means that you can describe different things within the concert. You can describe the structure, you can define the look of the musicians, and so on. And finally, multi-perspective is that we want to access this content by different ways. For instance, by different locations of the, of the auditorium, or by different perspectives. For instance, the perspective of a naive user, or the perspective of a musician. So then we have worked into trying to provide facilities to uh, re explore, enjoy, and share the concert. And we provide technologies that can be used before, during, and after the concert. Of course, in a tablet or in a computer. So in particular, we focus on this scenario, which is virtual concert guide, overseeing the music, focusing attention and switching viewpoints, and joining the orchestra. And I will tell you a little bit what has been done in this respect. Of course, when we address this repertoire uh, in the community, it's very, uh, it's very challenging. Because we usually work with songs, and songs are very short. Even the most uh, research is done in 31 seconds of songs, so not even the whole song. And here we deal with pieces which are one hour of duration. In addition, we have pieces which are very complex. It's not the same to analyze maybe pop songs, which is built by three, four chords, than maybe this kind of music, which is very complex. And we have a lot of data associated. And acoustically, it is also very complex. This is an, an image of a prototype I will show later up, uh, on different instruments playing that. So there are sections, there are also different uh, timbres that we have to analyze. And of course, we have mo different modalities. So this is the repertoire. I won't get into details, but just to have an idea of the kind of data we have. We have uh, different cameras, different microphones. We have uh, many information. And maybe depending on the quality and also on the information you have, you have uh, maybe uh, around 100 gigabytes for one of these concerts. Of course, if you compare with different performances of the same piece, then you will have it multiplied by the number of performances. One thing I wanted to mention is that working with classical music has an advantage that, in fact, you have the score of the, of the music. This is not happening, for instance, in pop music, where you don't have any score. But the musical score is available, but still not at all uh, fully digitalized. So we had problems in that. So the first thing, or the first thing we did, is to try to develop a tool that you can have all this information accessible for building uh, application for learning uh, training models and so on. And we work on a, or we contributed to a, to a repository which is developed at the MTG, which is called Repovis, uh, which is a web browser where you can store information, multimodal information about the classical music concert. And I will now get some time to play you uh, some music, and then you can maybe check or visualize different information uh, that we do. Just uh, have in mind that this is uh, all in a browser, so then it can be it can be integrated in many applications because using API you can always build applications on top of that. So it's uh, a web system. And then I will play you one of the pieces we have worked in the project. <laughs>
रोज के बड़े रहे Okay, so this is, uh, makes you maybe realize uh, all the information we can get from the same concert and then different ways of exploring this information. Of course, this was uh, all the visualizations you saw were for, for the framework, but not all of them are, are, are used in the real application. Now I wanted to comment to you about five research topics we have been dealing with. Because our idea then is to uh, provide facilities to describe this content, interact, and, uh, and we have been mainly focusing on these uh, different topics. And I will very briefly talk to you a little bit about that. The first one is melody. You know, melody is the, the thing, if you, if you listen to a song or to music and you want to, to, to remember or imitate, you will imitate or you will remember the melody. It's the, the things we can easily remember better than, um, for instance, the, the, the instrumentation. So the melody, uh, uh, melody extraction methods try to, to simplify music into a, a, a contour. This is, if you see now, there is the, this uh, song, Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. And if you sing it, you will see this is a melodic contour. So we try to go from a, from a very complex piece, which is the, the, the symphonic music, to, to this simple melodic contour. Uh, with the difference that we don't have the score, so we have only an audio signal, okay? So why we want to do that? Because for naive users, it is more intuitive to look at the melody than look at the score. And also, if you want to retrieve music, you can sing it and then you can compare it with different songs or different parts and then you can find the part you want, want to make. Of course, melody is related to pitch, which is a perceptual attribute of people where we can differentiate sounds and is linked into uh, uh, to fundamental frequency which is the signal property we want to measure which is related to periodicity in the time domain signal or in the frequency domain. Of course this is an example for a very simple signal. Uh, the signal we have in orchestra is very uh, much more complex. So which is the goal of our research? The goal of this research has been to extract from audio signal just the, the melody, okay? Of course, uh, this and this is the currently the PhD work by Juanjo Bosch, which is uh, here in the audience. So, of course, in the if you get popular music or songs, uh, for instance, uh, this song. This is. Uh, there was something inside of you. I thought that I would never find angel. Okay, so structuring the melody is kind of uh, difficult, in fact, from the signal, but from a perceptual point of view, it's easier. And this would be the melody. Sorry. Okay. Sorry, I don't know what happens. Okay, so the task of melody structure is equivalent to the task of describing the, the voice and then the pitch. But if I play you an excerpt of classical music, try please to sing along with it and define which will be the melody. Let me.
Okay, so you see it's more complex. There is, uh, in fact, the, the, there is a very challenging to describe melody in this type of material because there are many overlapping sources, so the signal is very complex. In addition, there is a melody is played by different instruments. Sometimes they play together in unison, that means the same note, but sometimes they play different notes, still you perceive uh, the same melody. So we have been working on trying to extract melody from this kind of data. Uh, those algorithms, for those of you that who do not know, are based on three different principles. And here I put a, a block a diagram of a method that Justin Salomon and I developed uh, in 2012, which is mostly thought for, for singing, but uh, which incorporate the three principles that uh, I was mentioning. The first one is uh, saliency. So, we may say that the melody source is more salient in the spectrum or in the signal than other sources. So we try to estimate saliency in the time domain or frequency time representation of the signal. This is a spectrogram. And then uh, uh, try to estimate which source is more salient. I won't get into the, the details of the algorithm. The second principle is to incorporate the continuity rule. So melodies are usually pitch uh, values, which are continuous. You cannot have a jump of uh, one octave from one second to, to the one millisecond to the next, no, or 50 milliseconds. So we use continuity rules. This is also uh, ideas from computational auditories in analysis area, where you try to incorporate those ideas to track or to track uh, melodies. And finally, we applied musical knowledge. Why? Because melodies maybe have uh, some properties, for instance, they might belong to a scale, they might be related also with I other instruments, etc. So this is state-of-the-art algorithm that we used. And then uh, we, from that we try to, to, to apply it to orchestra. Of course, the first thing we, we do, and this is the usual methodology, we got many musical excerpts from different pieces of orchestra music. You see here that this is a um, statistics of the melody play, or of the instrument playing the melody. Sometimes, oops, sorry. Uh, uh, sometimes there is a string instruments that play the melody, brass or woodwinds, but many of the times there's an alternation or a combination of instruments. Uh, from that, we try to annotate which are the melody or which is the melody. And for that, we ask people to sing along with the music. So we ask people to listen to the music, to listen several times to memorize or try to, to learn a little bit and sing along. And then we analyze aspects such as their perception, their agreement, how this is related to, to different musical properties. For instance, if the melody is very complex, it's the more difficult to sing. How is this relates also to, to our capability of singing, of course, because maybe we cannot sing a certain intervals. So we have analyzed that and I will show you just an example. And from that, after measuring the agreement, we have a collection with annotated melody that we can use to compare to our computational models. I will just show you an example of the melody you heard before. Let me play a little bit so that you remember. And then how four different people sang this melody. I guess some of you might have taken part in this experiment. Okay, so you, you see people do it pretty well. I mean, they have some <coughs> problems, but they mostly agree on that. But if you look for, for, for algorithms, they do much worse. So I guess you will agree that you cannot use that for, for any application. So what we have been working on that, on improving that kind of algorithms. We have also published this data set for people to evaluate their methods on our particular material. And we have managed to get 
good results using algorithms, maybe without getting into details, which are more uh, more uh, general, not only focusing on singing, which have also uh, can characterize not only one melodic line but uh, several melodic lines, and also that can be also used in the score if we have it available. And of course, there is a, a, a competition in our area. There is an annual competition where you submit your method and it's evaluated against others. And we have very good performance, not only for, for symphonic, but also for other genres. Like we managed to also contribute to the field. And uh, we have developed also a, a, a prototype for visualizing melody. And let me show you where is it. Okay, I don't see my screen now. Okay, but I will then skip this. So you can maybe, if you have time later, <laughs> you can connect it and then you can just uh, visualize the melody while you're listening to the music. Okay, so the second topic I wanted to mention is about structure. Uh, musical structure is a very interesting topic of research, especially in this kind of, uh, kind of repertoire. Why? Because you have pieces which are one hour long and then you want to know how it's organized. For instance, some people might want to know how to, they have to applaud, or when is the soloist going to play, or when are the important themes which appear. So musical structure is a very nice uh, topic of research. A structure is related to repetition and also to changes. So we use principles from uh, pattern recognition, we look for patterns in the music, and we also use principle for continuity and novelty detection in the music. So in fact, uh, experts also do structural analysis. So when they analyze music, they tend to structure into segments, this kind of uh, analysis, and they name it, for instance, a, 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 or like uh, exposition, development, and so on. So uh, uh, structure in, um, in symphonic music is built by two different uh, resources. Composers first use tonality. For those of you who know music, tonality is the way we organize pitch information, like note information. In fact, uh, tonality is used to, to, to convey tension. So when you have a, uh, something which is in the key, you are more relaxed. And when you have something which is not on the key, you are more stressed. So people and composers use that to, to communicate the structure. And uh, of course, in symbolic music, you have a lot of uh, changes in, in tonality and key, which are called modulations. For instance, this is the typical structure of the sonata form, which is uh, used in many symphonies, but not really um, uh, as it is, but more developed way, where you always have an exposition, which is in the tonic, a development, which is in the fifth, and then a recapitulation, which is in the tonic. Uh, the other uh, resource that, uh, that uh, composers use to communicate a structure is instrumentation. So it's how you, you make instruments play, of the uh, instruments of the orchestra play, and which notes do they play. Because by making instruments play different notes, you can maybe get some dissonance effect. You can get some effect also of uh, very well-known effects, for instance, the contrast between section or what we call the orchestral crescendo, that there's always a, a change in number of instruments and in orchestration. So these are the two aspects that we try to model computationally. And uh, in order to evaluate, of course, we need data and annotated data. So instead of asking people, naive listeners, to annotate one hour recording of a symphonic piece, we got experts. Because you know, many experts write about music. They write about the structure of pieces. And we got this piece, which is the Eroica, uh, which is the Third Symphony of Beethoven, so many people have written about that. So we got like eight uh, music analysts, uh, and they have, uh, these are uh, the papers that have, uh, that have uh, provided a uh, structural analysis of, uh, of this piece. And we also gather notes from 10 symphony orchestras, the program notes, you know, the... the uh, yeah, oops. Sorry. <laughs> it was not my slides, maybe it's... <laughs> and, uh, and to find out which kind of information. Uh, when you work with musicians or with musicologists, they, they do not, or it's usual that uh, they do not agree, for instance. Uh, we, we tried to see and there was a lack of, uh, of uh, discrepancies. 
So music analy analysis is also very personal. So, but in order to arrive to some ground truth annotation, we could put a threshold of if three people agree, there is a boundary. And then we, we only we, with that, we found 16 segment boundaries in the exposition of the Eroica symphony. So that means a lot of segments you have to detect. So this, we put those segments into, into, this is the red lines you see here, and then we use some of our computational methods. For instance, one uh, descriptor we use is tonality. We estimate it directly from the audio or from the MIDI by using information from cognition, like how the tonality is defined. Uh, and then we do it in a multi-scale way. So this is kind of similar to, to wavelets, where you have a global descriptors and then you have local descriptors. For instance, this will be the global key. Green, maybe is uh, I don't remember the key, but it's one particular key, and then local key. And then you can find segments. Of course, there are segments that were found by using key information. Other ones were not found. And in addition, we also did some analysis of instrumentation and orchestration, and we found out that all relevant structural boundaries correspond to changes in instrumentation. For instance, here you see we have a simple representation of instruments and uh, when they are active in the, in the piece, and we can then identify if they are playing or not playing, we can identify in those segments. So with um, all the symphonic pieces are very complex, computationally we can model the structure and we can represent it to, to people so that they have a map to follow when they listen to a musical piece. Of course, there is a difficulty of large-scale evaluation, so if you want to do evaluation over a lot of symphonies, this is very hard because analysts will not agree if they have different way of annotating and so on. And also, there are some uh, features that have to be personalized. For instance, people that know music will pay attention to something more related to music theory, and people that do not know music maybe have attention to more instruments that are playing. Uh, the three topic I wanted to, to talk to you about is instrument emphasis. And this is uh, the idea that if you listen to an orchestra, there are 100 instruments, you listen to the whole thing, but we want to provide people the possibility of listening to particular instruments. So for instance, I uh, want to listen to the cello, or I really like the oboe, or I don't really know where, uh, how a clarinet sounds, so we would like to uh, get people accessing the different instruments of the orchestra. This is what we call instrument emphasis. Like, I want to emphasize this instrument, I want to listen louder. So we uh, have been working also on, uh, on trying to, from the acoustic signal, trying to separate the different instruments. Uh, after this separation, uh, trying to emphasize and trying to locate them on the, on the scenario so that when we locate the instrument, we separate them, we can simulate different locations of the, of the hall. We can simulate that you are moving or that you are going through different places in the auditorium. Uh, those approaches usually uh, are based on knowing at each moment which notes are playing uh, each particular instrument. So we need to align, score and acoustic information for that. And this is uh, still a huge topic of research. Uh, what we do in our approach is that we try, and this is so, uh, the world why Julio Carabias was uh, also visiting professor here, is as we know the number of channels, and we, uh, sorry, on the number of instruments, and we do the number of channels, we try to estimate in which channel each instrument is more predominant. And from that, we try to separate for this particular channel. Of course, we have a multi channel recording of the orchestra, but the microphones are not located close to the to the specific instruments. They are just on the on the on the top, so in an array of microphones. But they are not particularly uh, targeting any instrument. So this is the approach uh, that we use for for source separation, which is called isolating the instrument. is based on non-negative factorization. I guess many people use it for other purposes, but we use it for that. <laughs> and uh, we try to to, to uh, separate different channels. So I will get, and we train uh, with, uh, with isolated samples of uh, musical instruments to learn about the timbre to be able to separate lately on the, on the mix. Of course, it's very important to align very well the score 
uh, with the audio because otherwise the results are very poor in terms of quality. I won't play this example because it's very bad. But uh, and the algorithms that do score alignment are still not very time uh, precise. So they have maybe one bit or two bits, uh, sorry, or, or half a bit of, of accuracy. So we have also been trying to, to uh, uh, synchronize audio with the score. And we have been done this using uh, some techniques from basic techniques from image processing. So we try to look at the spectrogram as an image and also not at the spectrum app, but at the, at the gains for, uh, uh, for uh, NMF, for non-negative matrix factorization. We try to, to uh, really locate the, the starting of each node. I will just show you now an example of instrument emphasis. You will hear uh, one minute of one piece. So in principle, you will hear one minute, and then you will be able to hear this, but uh, played only by separated instruments. Then we So uh, you may have seen the quality is not, it's not uh, the best one, but uh, if you mix it with other instruments, from, for instance here, you can emphasize the instrument and you can listen uh, louder. So you don't have to separate, but just emphasize. This is also a prototype we have on the web, you can also check it, that where you can select the different instruments and you can listen to the different instruments of the orchestra. And we can do things like, for instance, this video, this was an engineering uh, project where uh, he created a way uh, to, to mix up the different instruments to, to maybe visualize as you were uh, in different position of the, of the whole. I will play a little bit of that. Okay, we are not very good in visual, uh, so it's not very nice, but <laughs> at least you get the idea. So now we're working in a way to provide immersive experiences in classical music concert using this kind of technology. 
Of course, we have been uh, working with this material. We have had some, we were very proud of our results and musicians say, oh, this is very bad. You cannot have it. This is uh, total. So we still need to work on the quality of the, of the separation. And uh, uh, also we take advantage of multi-channel recordings, but sometimes th those are not very useful if they are not well placed. So uh, we will also to work which is the most optimal configuration for recording that. Uh, the fourth thing I wanted to talk is about gesture modeling. Uh, we have been all uh, working also on trying to model gesture of the musicians. This is uh, also a joint work with the SMOC, with the conservatory, where we have access to conductors and musicians. And we have been trying to model the conductor because he's the boss of the orchestra. So he's the one that is conveying with the gestures all the, all the information to the musicians. So we developed some uh, tools to technology in real time to get uh, gesture or mock-up uh, feature extractions, for instance, velocity or acceleration of uh, movements of the conductor uh, using Kinect. And then also you can store all this information in RepoVis and access it later. And for that, we have been doing some things. For instance, we have been trying to observe how people move with the music, how people will, uh, will try to to, to conduct an orchestra, and we have seen some, some uh, strategies or common strategies of people that try to communicate different tempo or different uh, intensity with different gestures. Uh, and uh, this was so, so maybe some of you took part on this study. We have also been uh, working on, on, on modeling expression, for instance, trying to model each person way of, uh, sorry, of, uh, of uh, conveying, for instance, articulation, like legato, staccato, or conveying, for instance, these different gestures, and trying to use machine learning for, for predicting it so that you can control a synthesizer that will do a uh, sound that will be more legato or staccato, depending on or your particular articulation. This will be presented in CHI also, and you can see the video. Uh, I don't have much, much time to go into that. And now we are building a game which is called Becoming the Maestro that also some of you may have played that try to, uh, to do a um, gamification of this, trying to, to make people aware of which are the challenges where, when you have to direct a, class, a classical orchestra, for instance, give the entrance to all the instruments or making sure they don't deviate from the, from the tempo. And we are building that now and we will have an evaluation, large scale evaluation. Uh, in the next future. So uh, finally I wanted to, to end up with the topic of music visualization. Uh, during the last years we have worked a lot on extracting information from music so we can have information about the melody, the instruments playing, the gesture or the harmony, the structure, but how do we present that to users. So we have been interested also in visualization. How do we visualize the, in, this information? Uh, of course, uh, there's not much research on that. So people just do research on how well do they describe music, but not how well do they represent if it's... Uh, and we have been collaborating also with uh, some people that do uh, analysis on users and so on. And we also see that music is very uh, challenging for visualization because there are some visualizations that might be more suitable for certain people, certain uh, user profile, and also some visualization might be more useful when you are in the concert or after. So this is also something we have studied. I just wanted to, to, uh, to show you a video of a concert that we did. We have done several concerts in the, in the, in the project. This one uh, that I will show was in, in a, in a uh, event which is called Singularity uh, Summit, which is an event for people that do with technology and also some, there was a lot of young people. So we wanted to make some educational, uh, uh, educational concert to show different, different properties of the music to the people that were there. And uh, all the descriptors we struck, we try to present it in a way people might, might, might understand. Uh, so we have a, the, we got the piece and we um, divided into different segments, 
and then we try to provide visualization of, of the score and the melodic lines, the key or the tonality, the instruments playing and the conducting gesture. So all the aspects I have been uh, presenting before. And let me show you a video of that so that you can have an idea of the results. Okay, we were in the back, we didn't thought about recording, so the quality of the video is someone that took his camera. <laughs> but uh, we had a very nice experience and also we are evaluating, uh, we evaluated with a group of users about their impression and we say, saw that, for instance, there is a different needs of uh, experts and naive uh, users of the kind of visualizations they want to make. There's the, the need to make uh, that people want to have control over these visualizations. So in a public space with a screen, you cannot have control, but maybe in your at home or with iPad or with computer, you can select. Also, there are some musicians that say it's maybe relevant as a learning tool to visualize music, but of course, people that like music, they prefer to listen, not to see anything. So it might be even worse for, for these people. And also, uh, we saw, uh, we found out very interesting ideas on the need for a compromise between surprise and uh, uh, overview of what is coming, and also a compromise between attracting attention towards overstimulation. And this has been done in collaboration with the Technical University of Delft, which is one of the partners of the of the project. So, just to conclude, I wanted to say that we have uh, experienced uh, that. A state of the art algorithms are, are good for that. Of course, there are errors. We have to improve a lot our research method, and we still have to understand many things about us as humans. We want to describe from music and how. And uh, also, now we are uh, seeing also that uh, uh, there's limitation of the state of the art algorithms, for instance, with this uh, kind of material, and also on a real concert, because some things work, but uh, when they have to do in real time, it is more difficult, for instance, the score alignment or the, or the visualization of instrumentation, you need some latency and it can be very bad for visualization. Also, we have had the opportunity in this project that we didn't have until now to work on user-centered paradigms because we have been 
we had been a lot working on the method, the algorithm, the signal processing part, and the and the and the classification part, but not on the real uh, user. That how are you going to present that to the user, and how is quality compared to accuracy? So we have learned a lot from that, and, f and now we are working uh, also to extend uh, these ideas into multimodal description. For instance, uh, together with Gloria Aro, we are working and Olga. Uh, she's working on the on the uh, description of music videos, also to 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 integrate visual cues into our descriptors of melody, structure, and so on. And also, uh, we would like to continue on that project for uh, for uh, uh, enlarging our our knowledge, for instance, to other setups. Uh, I wanted just to finish with uh, uh, with a recognition to all the people that have worked on that. These are a photo we took that. I think we need a new one because there's now some people more. And uh, uh, also, I would like to, to emphasize that we are opening our data and our technologies to, to the public domain. And this is very nice because you get much feedback from, from the way people use that is maybe very different to the one you thought. And for instance, this is from, uh, from the Melody Extraction software, so we want to also to keep that in. So if you are interested in some of these, please uh, let me know, and then we can find a, we are uh, open to, to, to provide all the data, all the, all the algorithms, and so on. So just to finish, uh, I wanted to invite you to uh, our event that uh, we will have at the end of March uh, at Art Santa Monica, uh, which is in Las Ramblas. And we will have a concert and an event which is called Classical Music in the 21st Century. So I hope you will have time to, to come and, and try out uh, Becoming the Maestro game, see a piano with some uh, visualizations of, uh, in real time, and just uh, uh, try to, to try out our prototype that we will also have there. So you are all welcome to come. Thank you very much. Any question? Yes. Hi, Emilia. Thank you for your talk. Very interesting. Uh, one important part of a concert is the public. So, in your project, do you take any consideration? Uh, do you take any features, any analysis of the public, how they react to the music uh, when they applause, whether the the characteristics of the of the public makes any difference. Uh, they are old. They are young. So uh, yeah, we have. And I haven't presented that because it's not really our our topic. But in the project, we have been analyzing the audience. Uh, there are some people that have put, for instance, physiological sensors in other projects. But in in Phoenix, we have mainly worked with uh, with. Uh, uh, in fact, with uh, evaluation and user behavioral experiment of users. But the problem is that in classical music, people applaud when they have to applaud. So, I mean, there is no such a thing. I mean, for instance, in other styles, you would maybe analyze in the audio or the video, you can get a lot of information. But in classical music, it's more difficult. Another thing we have done is to analyze, for instance, Twitter and also how people tweet. But of course, in classical music, you cannot bring your phone. So this was a limitation of the of the this particular setup that if we have maybe worked on the, on pop music and people we can ask people but for instance we had one concert in the and the smoke and we asked people to record and then send the video so then we could analyze the which are the moments they record which are the most uh, or we ask people to tweet and then we can analyze data so these are the approach we are following like analyzing uh, maybe audio information in during the concert, trying to get cues from tweet, Twitter or also from uh, from their videos or the photos they make during the concert. Thank you for the nice overview. Thank you, you start 
by, or, or you say that you start by analyzing recordings and score and information that you have and try to extract information from it. But actually, can't you also extract information from the creation process itself? For example, I guess most composers use some kind of a method in order to create music. It's probably not a random process. So using that information should also enable the analysis later on. Yes. Did you I try mean, in that for, direction? Yeah, in this particular project, as the composers, you mean, are not available, we are, <laughs> but we have used, for instance, information on the edition process. For instance, if the editors that are creating the, the final recording, they use, or the final video, for instance, the edited video, they use information about uh, different cameras. For instance, the way they do it is useful for learning about that. Or if we can, for instance, store multi-track recordings and also see how the producer created the mix, we can learn a lot also from that. In the, creation, in, the, in the composition process, there are some initiatives that people can really document the, the, the creative process, but still there are not much documentation. But you are right that if we had a way to make it uh, available, it would be much easier. And for instance, some now some, there are some initiatives to make the, 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 the data open when you are creating a mix, so you will have all raw material to work with because then dealing with the stereo recording is very difficult. But if you had all the information, you could maybe more do more, more things. So yes. So maybe another question on uh, not the formal um, analysis of the music, but sometimes you, you may know uh, when a particular piece was created and the contextual. Yes. Uh, yes. factors yeah. uh, and also the music was dedicated to, su to someone the music came after a, yeah. a particular event in the life of the composer so do you use that in order yes. to enhance for example the experience the yes last, for instance I didn't focus but there is one use case which is digital program notes and there what we do we crawl the web with the composer the piece and, and we look for music specific websites or for and then uh, in order to build the program notes we use this information and we personalize for instance if we for for we have three levels of musical expertise and then we can maybe for a music expert we provide more uh, musical information maybe for a naive ex uh, listener we also provide some historical context so yes we we do integrate that it's very difficult to personalize in a single person uh, kind of thing, but uh, we, we initially tried to use uh, profiling, a personal profile, but now we have three levels of ex expertise. Marcelo. So, yeah, thank you for a wonderful talk. So, um, I have this... Um, this question, uh, personally, I think a good part of the experience of being at a concert is being able to hear the music coming from all around you, as opposed to listening at home, even if it's a good recording where you're hearing just stereo. So the records you listen to at home have been uh, recorded at the live concert, say, and but there has been a uh, placement of microphones, and I'm assuming there's been some mixing going on. Uh, so my question is, have you thought, or is it already been done, or whatever, um, uh, using this kind of um, analysis of the performance to optimize the, both the placement of the microphones and the mixing so that the experience yeah. at home is as close as possible to the experience at the concert? Yeah, there's some research on automatic mixing that try to, to get the best uh, mixing for each kind of setup. So there is... Okay. Um, there are practical reasons also in the orchestras for not changing anything <laughs> that you have. So we have not experimented with that in the project, for instance. They had their own way to record and that's it. You know, and it sounds very good. So, but uh, yes, the, you can estimate, for instance, the way they uh, from the mix and the different channels. Then you can do the link. It's the same with the with the video. You can do the link between ca fixed cameras and then the edition. No, so then then you can know 
uh, what will be better for each platform or for each setup of, uh, of, uh, of uh, or here into that. And with this uh, virtual reality idea, we have we are working with uh, create experiences that you can be more immersive into the concert than stereo recordings. Okay, um, thank you for the nice talk. Um, I have a, just a, a little suggestion. Is Have you ever considered to look at ballet choreographers or ballet dancers to grasp, to grasp in any sense uh, how can you transform or how can you convert the music, the acoustic music to the visual domain? So maybe the gestures they use, the things, the moments that they emphasize, the way they dance, how is the music visualized? Visualize it for ballet choreographers. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. We, I have not uh, addressed that. Um, no. <laughs> but yes, it would be a nice project to do. We have been doing something on opera or on uh, about also also the movement of the the same performer when they perform, but not of dancing. Uh, there is some research, but not we have done to, done that. Any other question? Thank you. Talk. Uh, before we leave, the faculty lunch has moved. Okay, it's gonna be in the Tiger Building, uh, ground floor, room. Okay, thank you.